thanks for joining us. My name is Tracy Cook, and I'm the online media manager for modernanalyst.com, the premier community for business analysts. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar entitled The Business Analyst in Global Business Teams. Today's webinar will last approximately 60 minutes, including the question and answer session at the end. Please be sure to submit your questions in advance using the questions feature of the GoToWebinar software. Today's featured speaker is Steve Blaze, PMI, PM, P, PMP, PBA, author, consultant, teacher, and coach. Steve has nearly 50 years experience in information technologies. And with that, Steve, welcome. Thank you, Tracy. And thank you for only referencing 50 years. I celebrated 55 years in IT uh, just a couple months ago. So 50 makes me sound so much younger. So we're going to talk about global teams. And of course, the first thing we want to do is understand what a global team is. So a global team has three dimensions. One that you know, most of you would understand is culturally diverse and geographically dispersed. But one of the dimensions is there is typically no common past or future. That is to say, with a co-located team or a team all in, say, the same building or the same area, it's likely that we have talked to each other at times, we've exchanged some phone calls, seen each other in the cafeteria, but globally, no. There's not a typical common past or future that we can share. So there is one strike against us in a global team. And of course, we're culturally diverse, geographically dispersed, and the communications are generally electronic. But the one thing that still remains the same, whether it's global or any other team, is that there is a common goal, the entire team. And that, of course, makes any group of people getting together is just a group of people until they have a single goal to work toward, in which is the case they become a team. So this global team has a single goal. If you're managing the global team, if you're organizing it, the first thing you want to do is make sure that everybody understands the goal that everyone on the team is working toward. Some characteristics of the global team, uh, as we said, it exists over multiple time zones. Typically, you have different parts of the organization, you know, deployment, headquarters, supply chains, and whatever, in different areas of the country. Um, it's very reliant nowadays on collaboration tools, and it involves the team members, management, and stakeholders from different cultural and corporate boundaries. And by corporate boundaries, you mean not just different corporations, but the same corporation is different in different areas. I worked with a, a global uh, food manufacturing company in New Jersey, Chicago. Washington, D.C., uh, south of Moscow, um, northeast of Paris, um, I think that was all. Everyone was like being in a different company, different boundaries, different things they did. And many companies have, you do different things, each, each area. Uh, you know, the, the, the software development area is in Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina. The marketing is in New York. Uh, the uh, call center is in Tallahassee, Florida, uh, in Birmingham, uh, England. So when we're talking about corporate boundaries, that's what we're talking about, across those kinds of corporate boundaries, not necessarily different companies. So when you've got a global project, the things you've got to be aware of, you've got to have an increased number of constraints on the project or the program or whatever you're working on. The, not only do you have where you are, but there are local regulations and jurisdictional controls on everywhere, all over the United or the world. There are different controls that you have to be aware of. From the, the, the fact that in the U.S., you know, 10 hours a day is not that unusual. Uh, it's a 40-hour week. In Germany and other areas of the Europe, it's a 35-hour week. And right there, you have a difference when you're trying to put the team together and get times and so forth. There's an increased amount of conflict. Automatically, undercurrent, unconscious, subconscious, 
that we're going to be somewhat in conflict with each other. And I'll explain why here in a minute. The lack of face-to-face -face interaction, as I'll explain also in a minute, will impact team trust. It's difficult to establish trust in a global project because you don't have a chance to see each other face to face. That means that any collaboration you're going to try to do is going to be much more difficult. And as a business analyst, as we're getting information from various different areas, instead of focusing on a accounts receivable department located down the hall, we're now getting information from various different accounts receivable departments in different parts of the global corporation. It becomes much more difficult because the information will contradict each other, will not be the same. Uh, and then if it contradicts, what do you use? Just in the US, not even talking about global, and this, this particular company is a Fortune 10 that I worked with, but they're not global. They're just, just U.S. And they became so big by buying up smaller companies, all companies that worked with health insurance out of uh, you know, prescription insurance and that type of thing. Each had their own different way of doing it. And each area of the company was there because a former company, was, was that's where the former company was, that's now part of the parent company. So we had Rhode Island, Chicago, um, Dallas, Texas, uh, just outside of Dallas, Texas, um, outside of Phoenix, Arizona, Salt Lake City, Pittsburgh, um, someplace in North Carolina that I never went to. And again, same company doing the same thing, but all of them different. They were different cultures, but the same company inside the same country. That was difficult because each area said, this is the way we do it, and the way we're doing it is right. Why is it right? Because we've been doing it for the past 20 years this way. We've been successful. The fact that you guys bought us is notwithstanding. And you had the same thing from all areas, each different area that they bought, each different system that we were working with. And that's within one company within one country. Imagine now going to different countries in different areas of the world. You say, oh, come on now. Why would we bother trying to do a global project? Why not just have a project that we do at headquarters and then roll it out everywhere? Well, let's look at some of the benefits of global projects. First of all, we get much more and wider, broader expertise. We get a larger resource pool. Diversity. People do things differently. So the fact that they do things differently might be something that, yeah, I hadn't thought of that. We don't do it this way, but that's a much better way. We never even considered it. The solutions will have greater corporate impact, greater global impact, because we're dealing with a wider range in the corporation. That will increase visibility, upper level management. If, in fact, you enjoy getting visibility, you've got concerns about upward management, visibility is right there for you. Wires range and scope. So you're constrained by the local laws, but also you get to learn about the local laws that provides a greater scope in the overall project that you're working on. Greater opportunity to include cultural variations in the overall global project, such as online websites, knowing that this particular word or this particular phrase means something different in that country. It's good to find that out during your developing the project and not after it's up and running. Brings to mind the in the, the Chevrolet back, oh, years ago, had a car called Nova. And uh, they wanted to sell the car in um, South American countries. Uh, they spoke Spanish. And it wasn't selling. And the reason why the Chevrolet Nova wasn't selling in Spanish countries is because Nova means it doesn't go in Spanish. Why no one in Detroit at General Motors considered that, we don't know. But certainly the project they were working on wasn't global because if it were, they would have found out. Larger number of participants because they're all over the world. So I'm not limited to, yeah, let's keep it to 12 because that's all we can fit in the conference room. We can fit as many as we want online. I don't know how many we have online right now, but you know we can 
as many as we want, as many as we think we can control. There's no constraint on space. And our global project will assist the corporation becoming more diverse because we are more diverse. So there are a lot of benefits. So that means basically, even if we don't want to, we're going to have to, well, simply because, well, the pandemic, right? Among other things, people are now all working away from each other rather than all in the same room co-located. So let's look at the challenges. These challenges apply whether you're leading it, leading the project, leading the group, leading the meeting, whether you're facilitating things or whether you're just a member of the team. And the first and foremost is lack of trust. That doesn't mean it's the first one we're going to attack. That doesn't mean it's the first one we're going to address. That means that underlying all the other challenges is lack of trust. Every other challenge leads to the fact that we're lack of trust. Now, generally, people fall into one of two categories. I trust everyone except those who have proven untrustworthy, or I don't trust anyone until they've earned my trust. That alone means that there is a trust issue between people. Remember Lencioni, or well, maybe you don't remember them, but um, Lencioni was one of the people who studied teams along with Tuckman and Belvin, and Lencioni came up with a, uh, his five dysfunctions of teams. And those of you who read will remember, and those who haven't, at the base of his five dysfunction pyramid is lack of trust. The essential issue in a dysfunctional team is the team doesn't trust the manager, the manager doesn't trust the team, the team doesn't trust each other, there's a lack of trust. This would be the challenge number one. And unfortunately, just like what they say in the theater, once you've lost your audience, you'll never get it back. It is very difficult if everyone starts out with a trusting attitude to get that back once it's lost. You've got to do everything else first and then get trust. And without trust, if your project is successful, it's luck, an accident. So what causes lack of trust? more so in a global team than in a face-to-face -face team? Well, the distance. I may not, uh, I may find it difficult to trust you because you're not around. You're not there, you're far away. Out of sight, out of mind. If you're out of my mind, yeah, you know, I don't have an instinctive trust of you, unless I'm one of those who trust everybody to begin with. If we're not talking, there's a lack of trust. The more communication there is, the better the trust is. And you will see that in the, you know, the marriage counselors and the, the, the therapists and all that say, you got to talk to each other. You've got to build your trust back up by talking to each other. It's just a matter. We humans want to have that communication. We've got to hear them. We've got to see. We've got to talk. Of course, you have different cultural communication styles. That person's different than me. I don't trust them. This goes all the way back to caveman times. When you have the, the, the caveman who's 5'4", and you know, a little squatty fellow with a with a saber tooth tiger pelt on him, and he runs into another caveman who was six foot two. Two arms, two legs, two eyes, a nose. They look the same except he's six foot two. Ah, he's not one of us. I don't trust him. Don't listen to him. Get out of here. Right. So that's in our amygdala, the subconscious. We don't trust people who are not like us. We like people who are like us. We trust people who are like us. So if you're going to have a different style, a different way of communication, a different culture, there's automatically a sense of non-trust. Of course, you have then misunderstood power structures and other aspects more re factoring into this lack of trust. So let's talk about communication. And I'll talk about communication in a minute also. What can we do? Well, obviously, we want to increase communications among and between the team in any way we can. We'll talk about ways of doing that shortly. We want to communicate consistently, communicate basically in the same way. We want to communicate respectfully. We want to vary the communication mechanism. What, what I mean by that is that we want to vary it both 
by the media and the time frame. So we want to uh, interrupt our Zoom meetings before everyone gets Zoom fatigue and have a, a teleconference where nobody has to look at anybody. We don't have to worry about, uh, you know, dressing the upper part of our body because that's what's on the camera. We're going to do, do uh, meetings by uh, uh, text meetings, uh, emails. It's just a simple phone call. We want to mix up the communication mechanism. This way that will establish more actual, more trust. Again, it's a subconscious thing. Also, the time frame. We want to vary, vary that time frame. Remember, we're talking about different time zones. So if you always start your meeting at 4 o'clock in the afternoon for the U.S. East Coast, that's 4 o'clock in the morning for the PAC rim. They always got to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning. It's not going to take long before they start getting, you know, what are these guys up to? How come they get to, to, to be on the meetings during their normal work day? So you run a couple of meetings at, uh, with them getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning and other meetings where they, they have their meeting at 9 o'clock and the East Coast has a meeting. They have to join the meeting at 9 o'clock at night from wherever they happen to be. So you vary it so that, okay, I, you know, I, I, I trust the fact that we're all part of the same team and we're not just the, the afterthoughts here. Ask for and accept feedback. Don't just ask for it and then complain about it and then, and then argue with it or not, you know, but actually accept it. Okay, that's a good thought. Thank you for thank you for that. Exchange photographs. Make sure everybody has a photograph of everybody else. I know you're on Zoom and you're seeing yourself, you know, there's the picture, you get to see each other's faces, but let's face it, you've been on meetings and, and not everybody shows their face. A lot of times they're just they don't show and there are technological difficulties that that don't allow the face to be shown i have one that it, it, particularly at night uh when i'm doing a, a meeting for, uh, with the mid-east i'm on on the phone at uh, on the zoom at, or the microsoft teams at 1 30 in the morning well for some reason my isp which is not reliable to begin with flakes a little bit and so you know instead we're going to exchange photographs Psychologically, they've done this, the functional MRI tests. Psychologically, the human brain looks at a picture and can't distinguish it from a real life. And they've done this because they see what lights up when they see a person sitting across the table from them with the, you know, you got the MRI on your head. And then they show a picture of the same person and the same lights light up, just like it, they, as far as the brain is concerned, that's a live person, even though it's a photograph. So what happens is if you have that photograph next to your computer as you're talking to somebody doing a uh, conference call, it's as though you're talking to the real person sitting next to you as far as your brain is concerned. You'll be more, uh, maybe more emotional and more, more friendly, perhaps. And here's a tip that you might consider if you are, particularly if you're putting the team together uh, or you're, if you're going to be gathering information from various people all over the world do a video of you walking, at least standing, so they see the whole body, right? Yeah, dressed like you're going to work. Maybe do it with the background of the building that you work in behind you. And uh, just a short, you know, two, maybe 30-second, one-minute video. Have somebody get the camera up, take a video. Preferably when they're walking, because, again, psychologically, we, can, we gain trust seeing people walk. And that, that goes, again, way back to the caveman. For some reason, the amygdala seeing you walk will, will drop that uh, concern about differences and all that. Here's the person who's like me, that this person's walking. But at least, you know, you, you, on the Zoom, yeah, okay, you're seeing each other, but you're only seeing them from the, from the, uh, the headshot. That doesn't necessarily engender all that trust. So just send along a video, this is me. Maybe in the video, you say, hi, this is uh, Steve. Uh, uh, welcome to the team room. I'll be talking to you next, uh, next week or next Monday, but I thought I'd introduce myself. And just that alone, they could look at the video and throw it away. But you've established an anchor. You put an imprint in their head of what Steve looks like. 
Some things, three tips for cultural sensitivity. Create an environment. Now, this is easy to do when it's all together and you know you, you can create that environment where you're comfortable. It's something you tell project managers. Make sure you create an environment where the team can be successful, right? What do you do in, in terms of a, a, a global where you're not really there together? It's your attitude, your mindset. If you tolerate failure, you're more curious than judgmental this creates a team where they are safe, where they are comfortable. If you're not, if somebody does something and it doesn't work, instead of saying, oh man, that, that, you're in trouble now, that didn't work, you failed, it cost the company money. Instead you say, hey, congratulations. Hey, hey, did everybody know that Steve just did this and it didn't work? All right, yay, Steve. Seriously, not, not sarcastically, so that it say, hey, we've eliminated a possibility now we've narrowed down what could work by eliminating some things that didn't work. In scientific note, a, a method is called falsification. The same thing about being curious. Miller's law says, if you truly want to understand what another person is saying, first, assume that what they're saying is true, then try to find out what it is true of. That means I'm gonna ask questions about what they're saying rather than saying, oh, come on, that can't be true. What are you talking about? If you're asking questions about what, what they're saying, they're going to feel included, they're going to feel comfortable, they're going to feel safe. You want to avoid the rigid structures, especially around uh, global interactions, and promote informal communication among the team members. You want them to feel as though there is a personal act, uh, 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 element to what's going on. It's not just business. I have been on, an, I don't know how many of these meetings, obviously, over the past couple of years, and it really is, it's a feeling like, okay, that's good, we just talked about that. It's kind of, you, you come away cold. There's no sense of, of accomplishment because we, we didn't connect. And I think that the people on the meeting, as we all might think, well, this is Zoom, how can you connect on Zoom? But you can try to make it personal. Creating that environment will help. Mostly, as the, the, the people who do this kind of studies have shown, the biggest way of creating trust is be consistent. From a cultural perspective, from a communication perspective, be consistent. It's the way your children can trust growing up. As long as you are consistent in your parenting, you can be right, you can be wrong, doesn't matter. As long as you are consistent, that and inculcates trust. Well, going into trust is communication, so let's talk a bit about communication. Obviously, we have different time zones. That's one of the rules. So one of the conditions of have, being a global team is that we have different time zones. And uh, I just mentioned the unreliable technology. So, you know, well, what do you do about it? What you do is make it transparent. Acknowledge it. I've been on meetings, I'll be at 1.30 in the morning, and we'll have the whole meeting, three-hour meeting, and then I'll get off, it's 4.30 in the morning when I, when I get off the phone, and, you know, that's it. They act as though I'm, you know, it's all, everybody's together in the same room, but we aren't. I'm tired. I'm, you know, I'm up in the middle of the night, or it could be the other way around. They could be up in the middle of the night. So the idea here as with the unreliable technology as well, is to acknowledge it. Yes, okay, hey, Steve, I noticed you're up here at uh, um, 1.30 in the morning. How's it over there? Is it, uh, uh, is it dark? No, I don't know what you'd say, but acknowledge the fact that you've got people who are on different time zones. So what is it? Uh, you guys are having breakfast and uh, you guys are having lunch, huh? All right. That reminds everybody in the meeting, everybody on the team, that we are in different time zones. It's so easy to forget. That's not something that's in our heads. We're not used to that. That's not a built-in part of our subconscious, that people are in different time zones. It doesn't compute. So we have to keep reminding people that we are in different time zones. You start a, a conference with three people on, to, on the telephone, 
One's in Paris and one's in Poland. And you say, okay, you got, you, what's the time over there? Okay, it's this time here. And uh, I appreciate you joining us at this awkward time or whatever. Same thing with the technology. If I'm doing these things at night, I will announce, okay, I'm going to have my camera on and in the beginning here, but because of the unreliable technology, and it seems only to happen at night, this, this, my ISP here, I'm in rural Florida, uh, and, uh, you know, it's going to start giving me that message about resources, so I'm going to have to get off the camera. So don't worry about it if I, if I get, uh, kill my camera. But at least you got a chance to see me in the beginning. I'm making it, you know, yeah, there is unreliable technology. We're admitting it. We're recognizing it. Now, the lack of experience, the non-synchronous, that's anything other than face-to-face. -face. <clears throat> same time, same place as face-to-face. -face. That's synchronous. We've had experience with telephones, obviously face-to-face -face meetings for eons. I remember a time when there weren't telephones and uh, the, the phone I used was uh, uh, you pick up the phone and you say to the operator, hi, I'd like, could you connect me to so-and-so? Some of you may find that totally like the, the dark ages. I think most of you probably have not lived in a time that didn't have smartphones. So we used to have phones. But let me ask you this. When's the first time you used Zoom? Six months ago? Two years ago? How much experience do you have as compared to using the smartphone, as compared to using the telephone? So we don't have a lot of experience with Zoom, Microsoft Teams. The, what we're using here, this GoToMeeting, has been around a little longer, but still, it's not that much longer. This is all new technology and changing and getting newer every day. So that is an issue that we have with communication. We don't have a lot of experience with it. And of course, if we decide to go asynchronous, we write emails, who knows when you're going to get the response. Right? You write a letter and you're going to get it back you know, weeks later. So the communication is difficult on a global basis. As a business analyst, or you may have some project managers out there, or project managers are going to be business analysts, business analysts are going to be project managers, you're going to be leading virtual meetings, either leading the teams, virtual teams as a project manager, for example, or you're going to be getting a meeting to go over re requirements as a business analyst or gathering information as a business analyst or discussing changes. But you will be leading meetings. So let's look at how to lead meetings, but you'll also be facilitating meetings. You won't be the leader. Somebody else will be moderating the meeting, and your job is to to facilitate. And there'll be times when you'll just be attending. So let's look at all of those because let's face it, this is the heart of global uh, meeting, global teams, the virtual meeting, whether it's Zoom and, and, and you can see each other's faces or it's voice only, a teleconference or just emails. Now, the four sec the sections that we have five stages of any meeting. Any get together, any information gathering at all has five stages. The four of them are here. The fifth one that we're not going to show is the follow up, and the follow up is exactly the same as non virtual. That, that, that doesn't change. But there are some things that will change in a virtual meeting from running a face to face meeting. To begin with, you want to warm up. By that, I mean before you, know, you have actors. You may, I don't know if you're familiar, uh, but, uh, you know, actors, before they go on stage, they go through warm-ups. They really stretch their, their mouth out, and they, they, they go high, as high as they can go, and low and loud and soft, and they warm up their vocal, their, 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 their throat, and mostly they're getting their lips, teeth, and tongue to warm up so that they're able, when they get on stage, to speak clearly and people will understand them. Well, that's the same thing for us. We're going to be on a meeting. I'm talking to you right now and you can't see my lips. You can't judge my face to understand what I'm saying 
if you didn't hear it very well. If I mumble, you might still catch on what I'm saying, or at least the intent. You don't see anything here. You have to go from my words only. So my words have to be clear. They have to be understandable because that's all I've got. That's all you have. So you're going to be running the meeting. You're going to be leading it, which means you'll be talking probably more than anyone. So before the meeting, read some things aloud. You don't have to go through A, E, I, O and do those kind of things. You're welcome to because that will help. But do some reading. If you've got notes, read through the notes aloud so that you're warming up your lips, teeth and tongue. Now, if your meeting is well in the afternoon and you've had you've been talking all day, not a problem. But if you haven't said anything for a while and you're you're at home and you're working and then you decide to have a meeting at two o'clock in the afternoon, you have a meeting scheduled and you haven't talked to anybody because you're home alone. The meeting starts and you say, I'm Steve, right? In your head, you're saying, hi, I'm Steve, welcome. But what is coming out is, I'm Steve, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's because you didn't warm up. Now, as you go along for the next uh, two or three minutes, you will slowly warm up and then you'll be elucidating and, and, and understandable. But why do that? Why not just warm up ahead of time? But also get your mind going and, you know, you know get up a little, when you're, when you're talking, throw your arms around a little bit. And that's what I'm doing right now. My arms are, are, are moving. That helps warm up. Make sure you invite only those who need to be there, but that's no different than you would do in a regular meeting. But one of the things that is different is this one. You're going to remove all distractions. Consider a conference room. A lot of them don't have windows. They're in inside part of the building. And there's nothing on the wall, maybe a picture and, or something. Uh, and uh, it's probably dark. And there's no distractions in there. You walk in and uh, you, you, all you've got is the meeting. And that's purposeful. We, we want you to focus on the meeting. And you know the situation if you, you, you uh, get a, a text message and you know, people, other people are talking, you're listening and looking around. And you say, I think I'll check my, my text message. And you pull your phone out surreptitiously. And then you're looking down. You got it down under the table so that no one can see what you're doing. You're looking down. And exactly at that moment, the moderator says, Oh, Steve, what do you think about this? And 12 people are all staring at you, looking at you, looking down uh, in your lap with your arms down there holding the phone. How embarrassing. So you want to remove all those distractions. Well, when you're home, what do you got? You're in your office. You got papers on your desk. You got a window with things going on outside. Uh, you got the dog barking and somebody mowing the lawn and people in the other parts of the house. And you, you know the TV is over there and there's, a, there's probably a good show on. You're thinking about food. You can go get some food. All sorts of distractions that will take you away from the focus on the meeting. So we want to purposely, just before the meeting, clear off your desk. Just stack everything up, put it in the, on the side, right in front of you. So there's nothing in front of you to, to cause you to be distracted, whether you are attending the meeting or leading the meeting, because it's so easy. You know, we all as human beings, we're going, to, we're going to be distracted by a light, by, a, by anything that moves, we'll automatically be, our eyes will follow it. That's because we're human beings. Arrive 50 minutes, do some socialization. The purpose of the socialization is to get people talking the same way, the same way as your warm up. So let's let's talk a little bit. That way we can all warm up together. Now during the first part of the meeting, we want to start the call immediately. In a face-to-face -face meeting, you can have people wandering in. You can talk to them. You can go over and talk to somebody one on one, and they can see you talking one on one, and they're talking themselves. And you, you know, do a little bit of socialization around the the table. And then when you think that everybody is there, you can say, "Okay, let's get together." Hard to do on the phone. Hard to do on a call. You've got people, and a lot of times I see that the call, they'll, they'll start the meeting, and then they'll start talking with one of the people, you know, who are in, hey, hey, Steve, how's it going? Uh, I understand you were doing such and such, and you'll have this call, conversation between the two of you. Well, the call hasn't started. Other people will be thinking about other things, and maybe they'll do a couple of extra emails. Or, you know, people are joining you. You have joined, and other people are joining you, and you're waiting for everybody to show up. 
And so, you know, we're, we're up there and we're going to do emails and stuff. And then when you call the meeting, it's a lot harder to get started. You got to pull them out of the emails. Best is when you get there, start the meeting, call immediately. No dead air. After you start the call, then do your socialization, get people talking. Get them feeling as though they are people and not just business functionaries. Remember that introductions are more mandatory in global. In a face-to-face, -face, everybody knows everybody. Uh, okay, everybody knows everybody. Let's move on with the media. You might know everybody in the, in the uh, conference call, but you're still going to introduce. And you're not going to say, okay, this is Charlie. Charlie's here and Fred and Sally and Alice. Charlie, let's start with you. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Now, everybody knows Charlie, but what we're doing is reminding everybody of what Charlie sounds like. This is Charlie's voice. So when we hear it later on, we'll know that's Charlie. And especially if we're not knowing each other, it helps us familiarize ourselves, especially if you say, you know, Charlie, tell us about your favorite sport or something to get people more human, break through the cultural barriers and the distrust. You want to probably go over etiquette and ground rules a little bit more carefully and assiduously in a virtual meeting because we're just not used to it. We don't do, haven't done it that much to have it ground in. In a face-to-face -face meeting, we probably don't have to because everybody knows what good etiquette is in a face-to-face -face meeting, even though we don't always follow it. In, uh, during the call, Simple, clear questions. Paraphrase the responses, all responses, with the exception of yes and no, unless it may not be quite as clear as a yes or no, but paraphrase it. You're doing that two way, two things. One is you're acknowledging the person who made the response, and if it's a question, the same thing, paraphrase the question. You're acknowledging that person. I listened to you and I just, and I heard what you had to say. That makes that person feel good. They actually get a little squirt of dopamine there because they were acknowledged. The second is you've got a bunch of different people from different cultures with different languages and so forth and dialects. So you're repeating it clearly and slowly for everybody else. Okay, Steve, you were saying that you thought that the um, high price of uh, uh, lamps in uh, Florida was due to, so you, you paraphrase it, a little slower and more specific, so everybody is sure that everybody understands. You do this throughout the meeting, and people are going to kind of not really be aware that you're doing it, but they are going to be aware of the communication that's going on. At the close, Close the meeting in five minutes or less. You always want to close on time. And you want to end it clearly. In your in your face-to-face -face meetings, you want to close on time. If you say it's an hour meeting, you get no more than an hour. That way you'll be better assured that people will come back to your meetings. For the uh, virtual meeting, it's even more important. Because you can't tell when people have other things you can't. Tell. Strange things are you can't tell if happening. So that's uh, the questions I have for uh, for you all. I'm getting the information here, or I think we've covered it. within five minutes. End it. Now your normal three questions that you ask in a normal meeting, you're still going to ask those. But be very clear when you do end it. I've been just recently, I had a couple of conference calls in the past couple of days, uh, Zoom and, and, and uh, Microsoft Teams. And OK, they, they we're at the end of the meeting and everybody kind of just hangs in there. I've had uh, I've, I've ended a meeting and I guess I wasn't as clear as I thought I was. And everyone's there. And then I hear somebody say, uh, Steve, are, are we done? Oh, yeah, yeah, I thought I had said we're, we're all done. 
Now, since I'm the moderator, I'm not going to click on the thing ending the meeting. I hate to have people still online and, and have it end. It's like a slap in the face. So I wait. And then, you know, three or four or five minutes goes by and there's still two people on the online. Clearly, they are doing something else. They forgot about the meeting. So then I'll can cancel out. But make it very clear. Okay, that's about all we're going to do. And uh, everybody have a good weekend and, and, and enjoy yourself. Uh, we're done here. Make sure that you let them know so they can get off. Now, how about when you're the facilitator? Pretty much the same you're not, uh, as when you're facilitating face-to-face, -face, but a couple of things are important. The idea of remaining neutral, all facilitators should remain neutral here, okay? You should remain neutral. In a face-to-face, -face, you can do that, and you can actually be a little bit less than neutral and say things that aren't maybe not considered to be neutral, but it'll still come across as neutral because of your body language and so forth. Online, it's difficult to tell. So you've got to bend over backwards to be neutral. Don't make, make, make it uh, obvious. Oh, I'm being neutral about this. I can't, I, I don't want to comment on it. But you're facilitating them to solve their problem. We're not going to provide potential solutions to it. And ensure all stakeholders are included. When you're in a face-to-face, -face, you can tell that somebody is sitting there and they're, they're not really willing to be included. They don't want to. They're looking down, looking away. Maybe they're shy. They don't like to talk in groups. So, you know, you ignore them. Or maybe you kind of gently ask them to if they have something to say. Then you can also tell when somebody has something to say and they're not. Online, you can't. Even if you're looking at the faces, it's hard to tell. So how do you include everybody? You don't want to call on them, especially if you can't see them. It's very embarrassing to call on somebody and, and say, so what do you think? Pause, pause, pause. Good. Um, gee, uh, uh, I, I, I go along with it, whatever it was. And clearly that person was doing emails or something else. They weren't listening to the meeting. And that's embarrassing for them, for you, for everybody. So it's kind of, you know, you don't, you want to, so how do you include them? By mentioning their names. So Alice, we were, I was talking to Alice the other day. By saying Alice, she has now been included. Um, Fred had a good idea, and what he said was, that opens up the gate. If Fred wants to add to it, he can you know, jump in and add to it. Same thing with, I was talking to Alice the other day, she might want to jump in, opening the door for them, but not calling on them, forcing them to say something when they're not ready. Over the course of the meeting, make sure that you have addressed everyone included them in something, an example or something. Try not to put anybody on the spot. If somebody's talking, it's certainly you know, good to, if, they, if they're clearly paying attention, but, you know, ask for a vote. You know, give everybody, give me a green, up, a green thumbs up if uh, you want to take a break or something, okay? But absolutely make sure that goes great, uh, great ways toward um, establishing the trust but what if you're just a participant? Well, in any meeting, you want to ask what your role is in the meeting. Why am I coming to this meeting? Oh, you don't want to ask it that way. That sounds kind of aggressive. What would you like me to do in this meeting? What should I bring? I want to be prepared for the meeting. So what, what, what's my role? Why am, I, why am I coming? Why do you want me in the meeting? And and obviously, if you've got too many meetings and you've been going to Zoom meetings all day and the person says, uh, I don't know, I just thought you might want to be a part of it. Say, no, nah, you can send me the, 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 the minutes. I'll, I'll take care of that. I don't need to be there. If they say, we need your view on such and such. OK, now I know. Now I can be prepared. And here's an interesting thing. The moderator says, hey, Steve, uh, what do you think about this? And I say, Okay, this is Steve, and I, that sounds funny, doesn't it? Now redundant. Steve, he called you Steve. Why are you identifying yourself again? Same thing as before. You want to let people know who you are every time you can. Associate the name with the voice. And here's the interesting thing from a cognitive perspective. If I say your name, what do you think, Steve? And then you start talking. 
they're not going to associate the name I said with you. If you start out and say, yes, this is this is Alan, and I want to, uh, uh, what I'm thinking is, they now will associate it. It's just the way our brain happens to work. So every time that you speak, even if you've been introduced, you identify yourself again. And I'm unfortunate, I'm still learning to do that, as probably all of us are, because again, it's, it's all new. Be ready to share your screen even if you're not. That means close all the things. Um, if you've got two screens, put the, the Teams or the Zoom on the other screen, not your primary screen. That way, if you get a phone call and it pops up, I, I, my mind started doing that for some reason. It come, tells me somebody's on the phone on my screen. But it's on my primary screen and my Zoom is on my other screen, so nobody ever sees it. We've heard all the stories about uh, you know doing a uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation and having text chats pop up on the screen while they're doing a PowerPoint presentation. So you want to clear everything. And even if you're on the uh, separate screen, get rid of everything behind it. Again, clearing distractions. If your if your PowerPoint, I mean your your Zoom presentation doesn't cover your entire screen, you're going to be distracted by anything behind it. Just in case somebody says, hey, Steve, can you share your screen and show us what you did? Now you're not worried about, well, what's up there? Especially if you happen to have been doing emails during the meeting. The culture, language, and dialect will affect communication. Right? We got uh, in New England can't talk to Texans in the United States, and Texans can't talk to New Englands because of their dialect. They don't understand each other. And they're in the same country speaking theoretically the same language. Remember the sender versus receiver. Uh, a guy by the name of Land did a lot of research and discovered that you have two types of people, two types of cultures, I should say sender, re, uh, re, uh, communication, and receiver. The sender assumes that it is the receiver's responsibility to understand. The receiver assumes that it's the sender's responsibility. Here's an example uh, from um, Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus, uh, where the sender and receiver, the woman is the receiver uh, communicator and the man is the sender. They're driving down the road, husband and wife, driving down the road for, on a long trip, on the highway. The wife gets hungry and she says, are, are you hungry? And he says, no, no, I'm fine, thank you. And they keep driving. She, they come to, a, to an older bachelor, she looks at it and says, oh, look at all those restaurants up there. There are a lot of really good restaurants. He says, yeah, I know, the chains are really expanding and practically every uh, exit has the same restaurants and they keep driving along. Comes along, she says, um, Joy is getting along about lunchtime, you know? Oh, yeah, we've been driving pretty much, making some good time. And they keep going. Finally, she says, you brute, I'm starving to death and you won't stop. I, you know, I, I've been trying to get some food in me and I'm, I'm, and he says, but you didn't say anything. I did, I've been telling you all along. He's expecting, if she's hungry, she, he, she's gonna say, I'm hungry, can we stop? And he say, okay, yeah, let's stop. He never heard her say that. As far as his concern, the way you communicate is by saying what you want. The way she communicates is by giving, basically talking about it so that the other person will do it. Eastern cultures tend to be receiver. They tend to talk about it so that you will make the decision. Western cultures tend to be savory. Tell me what it is you want up front. There's not good or bad in either of them. They're just different. If you've got a global team, you've got to be aware of this kind of cultural communication difference. Remember that some people are audio, video, video, visual, and kinetic. Make sure you include all of them in your communications. Some of the issues that we have in cultural differences, the basically we don't understand that there are cultural differences in what they are, such as the one I just mentioned about sender versus receiver. I have heard this many times that there is no place for cultural differences. This is business. Just like we don't have different languages, the language of business is English. You don't know how to speak English, you don't, you don't deserve to be in business. 
So you know, we're all going to act the same way. We're all going to act business, business culture. That's not true. There's no way you can get rid of your culture. Same thing with emotions. There's a, one of the great all-time lines in the movies comes from the movie called League of Our Own, where Tom Hanks as the coach of a team and one of his players, all a, a female baseball team, is crying. And he looks at her and says, you're crying? Are you crying? There's no crying in baseball. That's the same thing. There's no emotions in business. Well, unfortunately, there are different emotional levels in different cultures. And we have to be aware of that. And we can't underestimate the power of those emotions. And there's no accounting, no, no concept. We have no concept of the difference between an individual culture got from their, their environment and their upbringing versus group culture. Say, you know, gangs of Los Angeles or New York. Some of the barriers, the power culture, distance. In the US, the distance is the length of a handshake. We stand in front of each other, we extend our hands, and we shake. Anything closer than that is getting into people's space. Whereas in Europe, it's a lot closer. You know, you can you you got you know in France they 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 embrace you a normal thing men embrace men kiss each other on the cheek and then you know right up next to each other the you know, person from from the U.S. would find that very uncomfortable. One of the theories for that is in the U.S. there's a lot of space so we can be have space in Europe there's the same amount of people but less space so you know you're automatically you have to give in and but that's a way of exerting power is by that cultural distance. This individualism versus conformity. Some countries are much more inclined to be conformist. Others, the US again, rugged individualism. Some countries and cultures are masculine oriented. And so if you are a business analyst and you are a woman and you are calling to, to uh, make appointments and stuff, in person, it's a little less onerous for you. But on the phone, where they don't have to show their face, you might get a lot of pushback and things that you don't like just because you're a woman. And that's just cultural. And you've got to be aware of that. Some cultures are very risk averse. We don't like risk. We're going to avoid it at all possibility. Some are working on a short term orientation as opposed to looking at it from the long term. And there are several cultures, many cultures, who will say yes to anything you ask of them. Doesn't matter what you ask. Yes, I need to have this by Thursday. Yes, I'll get it to you. Thursday comes, they don't have it. And you say, I thought you said you were going to have it by Thursday. You told me yes. And they look at you like, yeah, so what's the problem? Yeah, I said, yes, I don't have it. But yeah, I said, yes, of course I'm going to say yes. What else am I going to say? Because it's inherent in their culture. I actually had a job one time with an Indian company where my job was to try to get the people, come up with a way of getting the employees so they wouldn't do that. Now, this person, Aaron Meyer, created this eight male scales of mapping. So you're going to map on each of these scales. And the idea is to define how the culture deals. So if you're in a situation as a business analyst of creating decisions, you're in a business analyst of scheduling things, you're in the uh, persuading somebody to do something, you've got to know that you may persuade them differently depends on the culture that you are dealing with. Obviously, if in the US you can get the, uh, um, I can't remember his name, Sioni or something, and read his book about how to persuade people because it's all US. But once you go outside, it's different. So you've got to know their culture in order to know how to persuade them, how they decide, how they disagree and, con and, and solve conflicts. So knowing them, being able to characterize them in each of these eight uh, characteristics makes it a lot easier, especially to focus on this is what I need. Now let's look at how this maps into, say, for example, expressiveness and confrontation. Now, you look at that and you might, especially those who are not in the US, might look at it and say, wait a minute, how did the US get in the middle? How did they get to be so perfectly balanced? 
Is it really, they, are they really evenly uh, uh, between expressiveness and unexpressive emotional and, and confrontational? That, why is the US, I don't think the US is like that. Well, they are. What this is, is relative. So what they've done is taken various different scores that uh, how emotionally expressive or unexpressive you are and how confrontational you are, come up with a score. This is the US's score and put them in the middle. Then everybody else is relative to the US. So Italy is much more emotionally expressive than the US and tends to be somewhat more confrontational. Sweden tends to be less expressive, emotionally expressive than the US and less confrontational and so forth. You can take any of those countries and put them in the middle and then this is the relationship of all the other countries to that. So, you know, don't immediately reject this as saying, oh, yeah, the US. It's just they happen to pick the US as their their relative point. They could have picked any country. You're also going to deal with differing management. Your, your people that you're on your team might be cross, cross matrix managed to somebody else. So you've got management that's inward or outward. You've got direct or indirect, kind of the same thing as uh, the, the um, uh, source and, and, and receiver versus sender. Um, I had a manager we, that, 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 that has in email versus calls. He always wanted everything emails, never wanted to do anything in person. Difference in levels of emotions in management. And finally, inter-team. You're on one team, you've got a global team, your team's working well, you've got other teams. Everything we talked about will apply to those other teams too, with the of the culture of the other team. You want to understand what the relationship is between teams and understand what your relationship is between the teams. Where do you fit in? understand the culture, and establish a meet standard for communication between the teams. Some ideas, observe, especially listening, ask the other person to repeat what you've asked of them and then repeat back what they've asked of you. Make use of asynchronous communications as well as synchronous communications like Zoom. Do a tele teleconference uh, without the Zoom. Uh, you know, do some emails and other ways of communicating. Don't just depend on of those meetings because you wouldn't if you were all local only depend on these corporate culture of listening to their stories especially during the meeting and observing the rituals and ask questions use humility i don't know everything so what can you tell me about this remember that trust builds rapport. Rapport builds communication. Communication builds trust. Trust underlies a successful global team. So with that, I'll call Tracy back. Thank you, Steve, for such a great presentation. It's really made me think so much about my own communication style, as well as when I'm working with uh, clients internationally. Um, you've also had some really nice comments already about such an interesting lecture, Steve. So thank you for that. You're it welcome. It looks like we don't have time for questions today, but again, Steve, we would like to thank you so much for your presentation today and your 55 years of experience in information <laughs> technology. So I again, will say then, uh, excuse me, Ter uh, Tracy, yes. uh, um, to all those listening, if you do have questions, uh, sorry, I'm sorry I didn't leave enough time. My email address is right there. If you send me an email with a question, you will get a response. I'm in semi-retirement with nothing better to do than sit around with a couple of laptops and answer emails, so I will get back to you. So I offer that to you if you have questions. Go ahead, Tracy. Well, thank you. Thank you, Steve, for that kind offer. And with that, again, Steve, thanks so much. We'd also like to thank everyone today for attending today's Modern Analyst webinar. I'd like to remind everyone that today's webinar, along with the slides, will be archived at the modernanalyst.com website within a business day. Uh, this concludes today's event, and we hope everyone has a great day. Thank you.
Happy holidays, everyone. Happy and New happy, Year. And Happy New Year, too. Thanks, Steve.